I'm talking about something which is which is young still. I mean, okay, it's not young because I first started thinking about this when I became chair, like the year I became chair in 2015. And if you, for those of you who've been chair, which means that I kind of didn't really do anything substantive or I didn't get very much written down until I stopped being chair. Um, and so then I went to the Institute and I finally had time to think. And I uh, involved my student, um, Omar, and my postdoc, Andrea. Andrea is now, uh, uh, now wishing he was still a postdoc, but he's now has a nice job in Pisa. So he's a uh, regular, a regular job. Um, and Omar will be finishing next year, hopefully. And I should also mention that a, a first year graduate student, Nikhil Shankar, uh, did some of these numerics I'll show you. In. <clears throat> All right. <coughs> so uh, I think I don't have to belabor this too much in this audience, but let me belabor it for a minute, just because there may be lots of different people here. So I'm going to talk about the 2D Euler and Navier-Stokes equations. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, here I've written them in uh, in velocity. So u is a vector field having two components. So I'm going to always be talking about 2D today, u1 uh, and u2. And then you can take the curl of that vector field and you get this equivalent set of equations for the scalar field q, which is my vorticity. Um, I always use Q for vorticity to not confuse or irritate the probabilist in me. So Q is my vorticity. And if there's nothing in red, if the red terms are gone, then this is the unforced Euler equation, which describes flow of an incompressible mean zero of vorticity field on the two-dimensional torus, so the square box with periodic boundary conditions. And K here is the BioSmart kernel that takes this vorticity and inverts it and gives you back the velocity field from it. So this is vorticity being affected by a velocity field of its own creation, all right? And then you may or may not have a forcing and a dissipative term. This Laplacian Q is a dissipative term. By the way, Susan, uh, local, local custom, how long am I supposed to speak? Oh, 50 minutes or so. Okay, great, thanks. I just trying to get the uh, side by side view so I can see if there's other faces. All right, great. So, um, so um, a lot of people, including myself, have done a lot of work of thinking about what happens if you stochastically force this equation. So, if you maybe add some stochastic forcing and some body forcing. So, why do we add this stochastic forcing historically? So, for a number of reasons. Um, if we just had this body forcing, if you have a deterministic dynamical system, it can be very hard to answer questions about long-term statistics, even whether they kind of stably exist or whether they're ergodic. That is, if you pick any initial condition, whether you have the same statistics. So we add this forcing for a number of different reasons, which I'll draw in a second, but we're often interested in making this at a certain scale, maybe mesoscopic or maybe large scale, and then looking at the energy flux in one direction, the entropy flux in the other direction. And this is kind of log Fourier mode number, and this is the log energy in a certain band of 40, okay? And so just, this is a cartoon in the back of my mind, but like I said, this is early days of this project. And uh, I don't have this to talk about yet, but I, I want you to think of it as motivating it because it will, I think it will be coming along parts of it eventually. That's the hope. That's why I'm doing this again, yet again. Susan's like, another talk, here we go, on this thing. No, okay, it's gonna be different, Susan, hold on. All right, so, so just for a second, let me tell you what we, what's been done in the past a little bit. So um, if you write this equation in Fourier, for instance, you get some quadratic interaction, and it, so there's this interaction between I, L, K terms, so the kth Fourier mode, here I've written the Fourier expansion, the kth Fourier mode is driven by a coupling to the modes which are in this kind of resonant relationship. And here's this coefficient, um, which basically doesn't vanish as long as the, the, the length of the, the Fourier index is not the same and they're not in this orthogonality or parallel relationship. And what we're interested in, what, so what people are interested in, so you're interested in, there's two conserved quantities for this system, I should say. So if I don't have this forcing, if this forcing is not here, so if I just have this part of the equation, the left-hand side, the Euler equations, that's just this left-hand side here, just the pure avection of vorticity, the energy and the enstrophy are conserved. And so since I'm writing this in vorticity coordinates, the enstrophy is the L2 norm and the energy is this H minus one norm, all right? Just, just to help set the stage for everyone. 
All right, so here we have this deterministic Euler equation. And so you can kind of define a flow, um, you know, a transport, a Kupferman operator, some people might call it. But you take a test function phi, which is maybe the total, the total norm in a certain part of phase space or, or the square of just any function you can think of that maps a vector field to a real number. And then you can evaluate this as kind of an operator pushing it forward to get a new function by starting from some initial function q, flowing forward time t, that's this time here, and then evaluating the function. That just gives you kind of a push forward of a density, if you will. This is some, you know, some observable, and you start with some density for a given q. And, and so an invariant measure is just a measure that when you pick the initial condition according to that measure, uh, it would this push forward here, this mu s t would still be equal to mu. And those are the kind of things we're interested in. All right, so there are lots of invariant measures for a system like this, a deterministic system. Basically, any function of the energy and entropy will be an invariant measure because these don't change with the flow, so it'll stay fixed. So one that people like to write down often are these you know, classical Gibbs-like measures, um, exponentiating the energy and the entropy with some combination. They're all, and these are all invariant for this flow, all right? Okay, when you stochastically force it though, you break, you, you kind of, you introduce now, now we have a randomness. So we have this random choice here. So now I have a new operator P instead of the S from before. And when I flow forward some test function, I just evaluate that test function on my trajectory. But now I average, that's this E here is the expectation over my choices of random forcing, okay? And so I average over that. And now I have the same kind of thing. I can still talk about invariant measures, but now, there's a classic condition that you can use that goes back to at least to, I mean, the, the seminal work is definitely a Formander, and it goes back at least to examples of Komogorov and others. Um, and uh, the span, if the span of these brackets of this nonlinearity interacting with the directions that I'm forcing, these ELs, if those span, you can mix that with the contraction from this semigroup from the Laplace, and if you're in the Navier-Stokes equation, and you can prove that there's a unique invariant measure under very mild conditions. And there's a lot of work on this, um, you know, dating back to the to the, the aughts, I guess, largely. Um, myself, Wayne Onus, and I, Pardue, and Martin Hare and myself kind of wrote down the final versions of this, the one that really got the sharp conditions and, and used this bracket condition to its fullest extent. And then there's kind of a parallel set of works of Brickman, Kupianen, and Kuksen and Shirakayan and others, and up to the present, it thinks about a slightly different version of this. But what I want to introduce is yet another version of this, um, and I can try to explain why. So why? Well, the reason I want a new model, there are a number of reasons, but the ones I'm going to talk about today are really that in these models, stochasticity tends to play two roles, or a couple roles. Um, so uh, let me, let me, before I show this, let me say this, I forgot what order my slides came. So there are, it, it serves a couple of roles. One, it, it, we had this dissipative term in the, in the Navier-Stokes equation. So energy is being removed from the system. So we need to inject energy somehow. So the stochastic forcing or the body forcing plays the role of injecting energy. It also plays the role of kind of keeping things non-generic. It wiggles things out of place, right? And it sets up a structure. Um, but somehow the kind of non-generacy is usually being injected randomness at a certain scale, energy at that scale by the randomness. And then we count on it cascading down through the nonlinear interactions to all the other scales to keep them generic. But I wanted to somehow separate those two actions in my model. So this new model tries to only use the stochastic agitation to make the system generic. Um, and I want to make, be able to go farther. So I want to make myself be in an easier situation. So I want to make this stochastic agitation more elliptic, if you will, that should maybe be in quotes, with, but, but somehow more respecting of the dynamics, not just in some direction in phase space that might be destroying the dynamics at that scale. Um, I want to allow a fixed body forcing, which keeps the, like, keeps the system out of equilibrium but maybe keeps it out of equilibrium in a very structured way. So I have some forcing, which is very structured, which will give some structure to the flow. So then I can maybe do more analysis. And lastly, kind of um, this one, whenever I say it, I feel a little bit um, inadvertently arrogant because I really don't mean it to be, but 
It's really actually just the opposite. It's, it's my simpleness. I want to try to come with a model that lets me think about very low dimensional and simple dynamics directly so that I can try to make more progress. So I can use the geometry better of the dynamical system. All right. So before I do that, let me show you some movies. I'm hoping, so I've had mixed luck showing these movies over Zoom. Sometimes they come out super pixelated. I'm gonna, let's see how the east-west tunnel is between Durham and Los Angeles. That's not the worst actually. All right, so here's my random model that I wanna show you. It certainly, it looks like two-dimensional fluid flow if you've ever seen it. Um, I'm plotting here in different radiuses of different Fourier shells. This is the energy and the entropy in these different Fourier shells. There it goes starting over again. Let's look at this again now. Um, now I'm re re applying the log of these energy and entropy. So this is kind of nice. This looks like it's a little bit, it's actually pixelated, but it's not as pixelated as you're seeing it. Um, but it is still rather pixelated. There's clearly a, a smallest length scale in the system. Let me show you another one. So here's a pair of vortices interacting in a way kind of nice and you start to see some thermalization maybe which is interesting to see in the entropy kind of its equipartition in some scale right here I can't draw all right one more time here's the energy entropy again one more time now it's in log there it goes okay. these are Nikhil Shekhar's model uh it's numerics all right so so how am I going to build this different kind of randomness? No way. So I'm going to think about, so everything I'm going to say today, let me tell you right away, it's two-dimensional Galerkin approximations. So that means I'm going to project onto a finite dimensional system of arbitrary big scale, but I'm not going to deal with the infinite dimensionality at the moment, okay? Just to talk about some first results, all right? Um, and you'll see why, because I'm doing some things that are a little bit more complicated than I've done past. So here's the two-dimensional Galerkin approximation. So I'm so I'm only thinking of L J K less than some n. So I'm, the magnitude of L J and K, these Fourier vectors, are less than some big n. And here I've written in Fourier. And I'm going to rewrite this now. So I want to make an observation that I can rewrite this as the sum of a bunch of different vector fields. So these V L J K, which are this these triple interactions. Okay, just these triplet interactions here. Right. Okay. And then and then a zero one, which is just my dissipation and my fixed body forcing. So if you do numerics, I don't think this is a very good numerical scheme for this set of equations. There are much better ones, but you sometimes people do things like this. You could think about doing operator splitting. So in other words, if I just take this set of vector fields here and I just think about them linearly ordered for a second, or some ordering, I could then flow from period of time for one of the vector fields, the kth one, and then flow for the next one, and then and then compose all these maps. So first flow with the zeroth vector field, then the first, then the second. And so the zeroth is always my dissipative one. And if I don't have the zeroth one, then I would have just these, these other ones. And I would just flow these together. And now we'll see in a minute that if, if I flow for a very short amount of time and cycle through these different vector fields, I get a a finite, I can get a good finite time approximation of the Navier-Stokes equation, all right? All right, but it has some advantages to me. So now what my random model is gonna be is a random splitting. So instead of just composing these all with a fixed time step, I'm gonna pick tau i one to n independent iid exponential random variables with mean h. So h is a small number, and I'm going to pick an exponential random variable, and I'm going to flow each of these maps for, an, for a short exponential amount of time and then compose them. And those, those videos I was showing you were exactly that, in fact. So those videos I was showing you, the only randomness in that system came from this random splitting. So a random little choices of the time compositions, okay? Now, so if once I fix this mean variable, I get a new semigroup. Now, it's not a semigroup in the sense that I can compose H, different H's and get a semigroup, but I can square this map, cube this map, I can take this map. So it's a discrete Markov semigroup. It's not a continuous time process. It's a discrete Markov semigroup. And I get the same 
weight in the same way I defined before. I could take an observable function G, evaluate this composition of random maps and get a new random point and then evaluate over the randomness, which just in this case means random evaluate over all the cats, okay? Then I still have my deterministic flow S. And if you care, just to point out to some people because it'll become useful, it's, this is obviously a random dynamical system with a skew flow structure, right? All right, with a helix. All right, so there's been a lot of work actually on these piecewise deterministic systems. So I, I actually got into them at the beginning of the last decade, the teens, I guess, um, because I was interested in some biological models that naturally had random switching in them. Like, believe it or not, Zach, uh, what, what grasshoppers use for lungs. All right, but that's a different talk. Um, and then there was a lot of work about round random sampling and ecological systems, like you're in an ec ecological system and, the ecology of the system changes from spring to fall to winter to summer. And you want to ask how that dynamics interact, or maybe there's some drift in the system over time. But it's also been used a lot for various kinds of Markov chain Monte Carlo samplers in, in computational statistics. Like, um, and these goes under these PDM piecewise deterministic Markov processes. And there's a whole bunch of work by a bunch of different authors. This is a tiny drop in the bucket of the authors who contributed to this. I should really update it. I know twice as many easily now off the top of my head. Um, but in some ways they can be much harder, but in some ways they have some nice properties also. All right, so now, um, so every once in a while, I, I took this out of the talk because I really want to talk about Navier Stokes for you guys. Um, we can also talk about the Lorentz system, which is this simple set of coupled ODs and nearest neighbor coupled ODs which is kind of supposed to be inspired. This is Lorentz's other model not Lorentz 63, this is Lorentz's 96 paper, which studies this model, which is used a lot in uh, parameter estimation and uncertainty quantification models that well, people want chaotic dynamics. And so we can prove all the things I'm gonna say about this and they're actually even simpler. And when we split this one, I'm just gonna notice that here we split it. And what is this little dynamics? This is just rotation. This is rotation in the kth and the kth plunge direction with the with the xk just giving the speed. So this is rotation that depends on speed. It's just a simple rotation. So I'm kind of decomposing this dynamics into a whole bunch of rotations. Decomposing, okay. So let's, so again, we have this random splitting just to remind you of everything, all right? Now let's talk a little bit about the structure of this. So for, okay, before I do that, actually, let me just point out a simple theorem we can prove, which I'll, I'm gonna to try to give some indications of the three sets of main theorems I prove and I talk about at the end of the talk. But let me postpone that till the end, just so I can give you some, some perspective. But we can prove the following thing. So here we have this semigroup, the random semigroup. If I take the expectation, of course, it's not random anymore, but it's a semigroup that comes from the random splitting. And if I compose it m times with itself, where t equals mh, then I flow the deterministic dynamics for time t. These two semigroups are very close to each other. As h goes to zero, they become order one from each other. And, and uh, this norm here is just uniformly bounded twice differentiable functions. So functions that have first and second derivative bounded. And then it's, so it's from that space into the space of just L infinity functions, continuous bounding, continuous functions, I should say. All right. Um, all right, so uh, just keep going. All right, so uh, I lied a little bit to you when I said that that splitting I was gonna use was just this Fourier splitting. I'm actually gonna use a real Fourier splitting. So I'm gonna further decompose the, the complex Fourier coefficient into real and imaginary parts. And that gives me these four sets of vectors, you know, real interacting with itself, complex interacting with itself, and then cross mode interactions. That's not really important, but I just wanna tell you that because now I wanna talk a little bit about Oh, and of course the norms, what's interesting about, so I should point this out. The reason we chose these particular triplets like this is that each of these triplets conserve both the energy and the entropy of the system. All right, so both the energy and the entropy are conserved for these systems. And that's one of the reasons we picked it. It's actually an interesting question to ask, what if we just conserved the energy, but not the entropy? And that's uh, maybe a topic for down the road. All right. So I don't know what happened there. Oh, I see. 
just to put a picture in. Okay, that's interesting. All right. So I want to talk to you a little bit about the geometry of this splitting. So because the energy and the entropy are conserved, the energy, I mean, the entropy, sorry, gives me a circle in three space in R3, and the energy gives me an ellipse. And so here's the energy ellipse. And when I intersect it with the entropy circle, sphere, I mean, you get some little wiggly trajectory. So this is what these, and there's another one over here, of course, symmetrically about this, but this is the trajectory of this dynamic. So it's a little curve that goes through R3. And that's what this dynamics follows. All right, and that curve is, is, is it's interesting. Um, and, uh, and, and what's interesting about it is if you start, the thing to notice here is if you start two points nearby each other, we actually have a shearing effect. Points will actually separate if they're, if they're on different energies and entropies here. So remember the total energy and entropy is conserved, but so are these little triplets, but because of these interactions, the energy entropy changes in different triplets over time. And there's a shearing effect that if I were to take another orbit right nearby and plot them, there would actually be a shearing effect. So, so there would be a separation of trajectories. And that's really important to kind of maintain the character of this system, okay? Are there any questions so far on this picture or anything I've talked about? This would be a really great time to ask if there was a question. Okay, so the first statement is this Euler dynamics. So this is what's interesting about this. So before all of the theorems have generally been about the Navier-Stokes equations or uh, with some kind of multiplicative noise, um, but even not so many there. But so we can now talk directly about this randomly split Euler. So for this randomly split 2D Euler equation, we can prove that there is a unique invariant measure which is absolutely continuous with respect to Hasdorf measure. All right, now there are many, many other invariant measures actually, because there are many, many, many fixed points of the Euler flow, all right? Because this acts like the Euler flow, it has all the fixed points of the Euler flow. But what we can show is that now there's one unique invariant measure which is absolutely continuous with respect to the volume measure of this surface that, compo that's, uh, that contains, uh, that has energy uh, E0 and entropy E1. And, and I should say it's a unique invariant measure on this set Q0, which I'll talk about next. The set Q0 you can think of as all the points that are possible fixed points. But the point is that this measure, this set, the measure of the set Q0 has Hausdorff measure zero. So the Hausdorff measure on this intersection of these two, of this variety, this intersection of these two surfaces if you look at this natural surface measure there, this set has measure zero. So this really is like saying there's a unique, even though the system has many invariant measures, there's a unique one that's absolutely contains with respect to the Lebesgue measure, if you will, in this setting, all right? Okay, so unlike the work, if you know the work that has been done about the stochastically forced average Stokes equation, here, this is a statement about the initial condition. And so there's some idea about not too many, so this is really complicated, but basically what this is saying is that there's some algebraic motion. Like if you start with certain degrees of freedom, not zero. So the A is all the places where you're not zero, all the Qs that are not zero. And then there's some, there's some algebraic condition where you start with a certain one that's in, that's in A, and then you move by adding and subtracting to different Fourier motion. And so it talks about kind of infinitesimally what modes become active over time if you start from this initial condition. And so this, this condition basically guarantees that if you start from this set, this initial condition, you don't get stuck on some lower dimensional submanifold, which is invariant, some kind of some, some, some special set of uh, reduced dynamics, all right? And the point is that this set we can show has, has Hasdorff measure zero in the appropriate set setting in this, on these spheres. So if you pick a random initial condition, you won't end up there. You won't end up on these bad sets. All right. So <clears throat> let me now tell you a little bit about in one slide how we prove the ergodicity. So what we end up proving is we prove that the, this semigroup is strong feller. Um, and the way we do that is a little bit of kind of what would be the equivalent of my back calculus in this setting. So we show that 
that so when you want to perturb, so this map is a trajectory. This is time here. And this is the trajectory of my switch dynamical system. I've drawn it smooth, but it's it's constantly being switched. And these are each of the little times. It runs this amount of time on the first dynamics, this amount of time on the second dynamic, this amount of time on the third, fourth, fifth, so on. And if you make a pertur perturbation in this initial condition, so in the initial state of the system, that gets transported to some perturbation at time at the at the time end. So this is a derivative with respect to the initial condition of this flow map. And what it turns out is you can also, of course, differentiate with respect to all these times. And that's this yellow angle here. And the point is, is we can actually prove this matrix given by the differentiation, it's, it, it's surjective onto this tangent space. So it's, it, it's, it covers, it's onto on this tangent space. And that means that this little equivalent of what would be a Malyavan matrix, this matrix which transfers a noise variation to a space variation derivative is almost surely invertible. And once we have that, then with a little bit of extra work, you can prove that you have this kind of regularizing property, which is strong feller. And then we can also show some kind of global irreducibility. Okay. And the way this works actually in this case, which is nice, is that we show that this map here is analytic. And so although I did all this for exponential random variables, I could have done it for different random variables. I could have done it just for random variables concentrated on H, on uniform from H over 2 to 3 over 2H, something like that. So I could have done that just as easily, and that would have been enough. Having a little, just a little bit of random wiggle is enough for this kind of nice thing. Now, the control theoretic properties, I should be careful. If you pick a, a choice of another choice, the current choice that we have requires there to be a concentration on, on small enough h, close enough to zero. Um, but that could possibly be removed. All right. So this is how we prove unique aggregacy. And why does this lead you to prove unique aggregacy? Because it says, if you will, if you start from two different initial conditions, you can actually say that their trajectories are related to each other. They're not mutually singular at, time, at, at the final time at this map. And that's enough to prove aggregacy. Because if you if you have from kind of arbitrary initial conditions, if the transition densities at after one cycle or two cycles of this dynamics are not singular, then you know that there can only be one invariant. All right. Okay. So what I, I've talked about Euler so far. So let me say what we can say about Nader Stokes. So the thing about Euler, remember, was I couldn't start from bad initial conditions. So with the Nader Stokes, if we add ourselves a dis Participation and a forcing. And as long as that forcing isn't at this value, if the forcing after it's been hit with the dissipation operator, so this, this lambda is my Laplacian. If you want, you can just think of it diagonal in Fourier space with minus k squared on it, or you can put something else. As long as this forcing here uh, doesn't, right? For the, in this, we're assuming this is non degenerate decision, but. In future works, I hope to get away from that. That's one of the reasons I'm interested in this model. And if I now, uh, as long as this point is not in this bad set of initial conditions, so in particular, if, if you force these two modes, for instance, in F, then that's enough to make sure that you have a new convariant. And now it has actually exponential convergence to equilibrium. But um, in some ways, I don't want to study the Navier Stokes equation. I really want to study Euler because I really want to think about indicit limits and things like that. All right. Okay, so this is another good place to stop if you want to ask me a question. How am I doing on time? Let's see, how am I doing? Uh, oh, I'm going. Oh, 37 minutes. Oh, I'm doing fine. Great. Any questions? All right. All right, so let me now give you an idea about um, Lyapunov exponents. So what are Lyapunov exponents? So Lyapunov exponents are, uh, so what, you, what they say, what they're discussing is basically you have, this is time, and you start with two initial conditions close by to each other, and you ask how do they separate over time, okay, based on the initial perturbation between them, all right? And this is 
my V initially. So of course the infinitesimal version of that is to, is to take the linearization, the derivative, this is the derivative in X, along a trajectory composed of itself n times, a, ran, a random choice. So when I do, write this n times, every, I should have said that clearly, every choice is again a random, new random choice of tau. I flow this forward and then I look at this normalized by V, I could equivalently just take V to be norm one. And then of course, if I'm expecting this to grow like e to the minus lambda, some function of T, I take the log or N in this case, the number of steps I take, I take the log to get rid of this, expo this exponential. And then I divide by one over N to get rid of this N here. And then that just gives me this growth rate, right? This separation. And so you should really think about this as the equivalent, the random version of eigenspaces for linearization, if you will, or, or in general, you know, if you have a time dependent flow, you really don't have eigenspaces for your linearization. But if you're in a stationary setting, the oscillatics multiplicative ergodic theorem tells you, in fact, you do. You have, first of all, you have numbers, which you could think of as the characteristic exponents, the, ex, the eigenvalues, and then a set of eigen subspaces. So the, the subspaces that you usually think of as eigenspaces are the differences between this flag of subspaces. And if you start in that subspace, then it will actually converge to that the up and up exponent. All right. And the, I'm noticing I'm this is the top one and it goes down to zero. Okay. So um, so kind of po positively up and up exponents are the hallmark of chaos. And this means that tra trajectories arbitrarily close separate exponentially in time. And in our setting, since we're talking about Euler, so I'm going to talk about Lyapunov exponents for Euler, which is what's interesting here, which is maybe what's novel. And also this, well, this model is different, but maybe no one else cares about this model than me. But it's going to preserve Lebesgue measure on this torus, right? Because, because maybe I didn't emphasize that enough. Let me just actually say that quickly, really carefully, loudly here. When I talked about Euler, sorry to do that, but I hate it when people do that. There the Hasdorff measure set is the unique measure. So it's the measure that's the unique invariant measure. I didn't say that very loud. I mean, it's just fluxes in this model. What I'm going to see, though, is the modeling the oil dynamics. So because of random versions, I just calculate the determinant for one map, it has determinant one. So that means that it has some positive the alpha exponents, some negative the alpha exponents, and they have to sum to zero because the determinant of this map, which is the exponential of those the sum of the alpha of exponents is one. So that sum has to be zero. So it's actually possible that all of my the alpha exponents are zero. That's possible. And so this is a well-known, interesting phenomenon, hard phenomenon. It's been studied a lot. Peter Voxnail is one of the people who's made great contributions to that. But it kind of goes back to uh, work of Furstenberg, um, at least, and, and, uh, and Keston, and you know, other people, Le Drapier, Bougerol, Young, others have said interesting, Carville have said interesting things about these problems, OK? I'm sure Peter will remind me of someone I forgot. All right. So, um, so what I want to talk about is uh, kind of work that follows the results of Boxendale. And it could have equally followed the results of Kiefer because we have everything probably to, but we wrote the one we wrote down more carefully at the moment was uh, the, the one that follows Boxendale's work. Although we have a lot of other facts that let us could let us use Kiefer. And this is related to some existing work for sure of Bedrosian, Blumenthal and uh, Push and Smith. The thing here is that this is about Navier-Stokes and the implicit limit in a way. Uh, it's still Glurkin approximations, but here we're gonna talk directly about Euler, okay? So what we can prove, and I should say we are writing the final parts down, but I have, we have it almost all written down now, so I'm pretty confident this is correct. So the, the, alpha, the stochastic dynamical system almost surely has a positive the alpha of exponent for Hasdorff almost every initial condition and almost every choice of mean step size h. So there are certain 
I, I can, I have, if you pick your H randomly initially, like just pick an H with respect to the big measure, um, at some, you know, uh, then there are certain pathological H's that I can't rule things out for. And Peter, this is where I would love to have a conversation with you because uh, I think I may just be doing something stupid. I think the result maybe of Kiefer would get rid of this condition, but my current proof has this condition for the moment, but that just may be temporary. All right, does everyone understand? So what we're telling you is that this system, if you follow one realization of this system, it's, you're gonna see exponential spreading of trajectories. You're gonna see positively up and up exponents. All right. A question? Yeah, please, who is there? I've lost, I've lost track of whether we're dealing with the Fourier modes now, or, or is this a statement about what happens to the flow which done your model with Fourier modes? This is- And this is to what is the- This is a, this is the, the, okay, so I don't quite know what, what you're talking about when you see each of these things. So, so this is that random composition of the Fourier maps for some arbitrary Glorkin approximation. So take Navier Stokes, truncate it to finite dimensions, right? Then do this random splitting. Did I answer your question, Peter? So the dimension D we're talking about here depends is, on the number, the number of Fourier modes. modes times two, because you have, so if you have number of Fourier modes, so that's the dimension of the box, Fourier box you kept N squared mm -hmm. times two, take out the condition for reality. So divide by two roughly. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Is that, is that, that is that? Yes, yes, that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So this is not like, this is a high dimensional system, right? Yeah. All right. Okay, proof of the positive the alpha. So this is not passive scalar, if that's what you're asking. So, all right. Proof of positive alpha of exponent. So this is, so now Peter, I'm cribbing right from Peter's game plan. So first notice that the determinants one, so the system preserved like Benjamin, which I've already said. So we will see, I already told you that this system is strong feller. And in fact, it's strong feller in the base system and it has a continuous transition density. Now it actually has a continuous, okay. So it actually has a transition density um, it's, it's actually has a transition density. If you consider the system itself and the projects, the dynamics on the projective bundle. So if you take the flow itself, this phi, and you take its derivative and you look at that acting on the tangent space and just normalize the tangent space to only be vectors of norm one, that's the projective bundle, ta projective tangent bundle. On that system, it actually has a continuous transition density on that on that extended system, okay? And we actually only need that it has a transition density with respect to the Hasdorff measure. All right, so, so the way you would do this is you assume that the top and bottom exponents are the same. All right, then, then there is, then, then, then one of two, this should be TWO, typo, sorry about that. One of two situations hold. So these are kind of the classic rigidity statements that go back I think, I mean, to Furstenberg is my understanding, maybe Peter can tell me, but I think it's Furstenberg. That's where I, the first, earliest place I know to read it. I think, I think Furstenberg is the place I saw it first. Yeah. And so one, either there exists an almost surely conformal invariant metric on this tangent bundle. And I'll remind you what that means in a second. That's kind of, a, this is a rigidity statement. There's two kinds of rigidity. One, there's this, so conformal just means that it's, it's structure in the tangent space depends only on the base point, essentially. If you push forward it uh, by a map, by all these maps, these random maps, it preserves it. And I'll talk what I mean exactly. And, and or alternatively, this D phi map simply permutes subspaces. There's a set of subspaces that are just permuted as it maps from one tangent space, the tangent space at X to the tangent space at where it ends up, okay? And what, so we assume that this is true. We show that neither the first one nor the second one can hold. And therefore our assumption is false. And therefore we end up with this statement, okay? Clear? All right, so I just, this is fresh enough. I mean, we've, we've been working on it for a while but I just wanted to kind of write it up by hand because I wanted to get it on one slide. 
So the idea is that we use the shearing. So if you pick two of these modes, you, you can get rid of, you can actually reduce it to just the dynamics on a circle. And the thing to notice here is this is QJ, QK, is that QL here, uh, oops, I seem to have made a mistake here. Uh, oh, shoot. This right here should be an L. I'm sorry. Okay. So, so this is just a rotation with a speed that's determined by the size. Oh, I made both. Right, by the size of QL. This is just a circle, right? This is Q dot X dot equals, equals Y, Y dot equals minus X. That's all that is, okay? So this is a rotation, but if, you're, if your QLs are a little different, the speed you rotate at is a little different. So that means that nearby points get shared because the rotation speed is different, all right? So this fits very well with our intuition from fluid mechanics of what's going on. So if you write the Jacobian, how it acts for one flow, you, if you pick a time so that you actually come exactly back, because this is just this rotation on the circle, you pick a time so you come exactly back to where you started. So now you have a map from the tangent space at that point back to itself. It's an identity plus a shear. All right. And then you say, well, if there was a conformal invariant metric, that look like so this is not the full argument but this is a lot of it there so a conformal invariant would mean you have a this is my metric in the tangent space at a point q and i push it forward so i push forward the point and i push forward the vectors and that has to be true that has to be that there has to, if it was if there was a conformal invariant this would be true for every choice of t that i made every choice of random t that i made and the point is is that if, if i start with just u equals v and some initial vector, then this is norm one in this, in this norm, and this should be a square there. But then this would have to be equal to one for all choices of n here. And by choosing n, you can actually get this to be a number different than one. So that rules that one out. All right. And now the other part, the other part is, so if I, before I had p was my semi-group, on the base space, on my on my uh, on my on my uh, state space, I'm going to let Q be now the, the base space plus a vector in the tangent bundle. So this is the Markov center group on the on the tangent projective tangent bundle, and I can show that that has a density with respect to. Length. So once you have that, you're basically done, because if there was, so what what what, what I need to show is not possible. I need to show there exists no random permutation of a fixed set of linear subspaces, EI, I1 to N for some large N, that depend on my base point, my point where I'm starting from. So that if I push forward that tangent space by the map, by the linearization, by the Jacobian, I just get the, the same family of linear spaces at a new at the new point but with an index. So I permute, I start with the ith one here, I get some new one that depends on the map. And the point is, is that we can show that that's impossible. And so the way you show it's impossible is you pick some vector here, you pick a vector in E1, let's say at some point X. And then you pick times, because this has a density, you can pick times so that when you push forward by those times, um, you can, you can do it so that you, you can actually pick the time so that one, you end up at the same base point, which I didn't mention in this slide here. And each of these directions is different, okay? Each of these directions is different, all right? And then once, and you could, in a way, you could just think about what I showed before with the shear map. You just pick different ends. They bring you back to the same place if you want to. And the directions can be different. The way they get pushed are different. And once you have enough, if you had to have m of these, if this was an if this space here was m dimensional, if you then have m plus one different vectors, it actually they can't all lie in that space because they're all different. All right, you can make them to be to make make them be not collinear. So I should say. All right, so so that means you can't just have this permutation property. All right, and so this condition fails. All right, so that's there's some small there's some details there, but that gives you the flavor. 
Are there any other questions? So basically the point is, is that what we do is we, we say there's a positive alpha and exon. The way we do it is by showing that these two conditions, and this is what everyone does. I mean, this is what people have been doing. I mean, I think maybe the first talk I heard of Peter give was something where he did something similar to this. All right, but what's nice here is we actually see these nice shearing flows. And those actually play an important role in, um, in uh, Sam, Alex, and Jacob's work also. But not the same exact things because uh, we have a lot more ellipticity here. And so we can actually do this directly, um, verifying these conditions by hand. And, and, and now we're gonna hopefully use these results to do our next set of things. All right, so let me, yeah, are there any other questions? I think I'm almost done. So how much longer do I have? Oh, I'm four minutes over, I think. So I think I should stop almost. So I'm gonna stop. No, you're, 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 you're fine. Okay, got, all right, so I can take- least, like, You've got at least five minutes left. Okay, good, because this is my last slide in some movies, okay. right? So uh, I'm now gonna show you something. So I kind of, I did, gave you the ergodicity, I gave you a flavor of how we did the ergodicity by this kind of integration by parts and the surjectivity of the map. And we use some geometric measure, we do some, uh, geometric measure theory to do that. And then I showed you how we proved these Lyapunov exponents are positive, almost surely. So the very first result was that the finite time as h goes to zero, maybe the most believable result that the splitting converges to the deterministic dynamics. So I'm gonna show this to you because this is something that somehow I can't believe I didn't know how to do. And I spent a lot of time in my life at some point reading about quantitative baker campbell Hasdorff formulas and thinking that that was gonna be the solution. And then it turns out you can just do it as usual, using Duhamel's principle, uh, like everything. So I just wanted to point this out because I think it was it was news to me, and it's probably not news to fifty percent of the, but it's news to one person. That's good. So here I take this random splitting, um, and there should be an expectation in front of here. I keep forgetting to put it. There's it should be an expectation in front of here. And so what is this random splitting? It says I I evolve for a random amount of time tau the first vector field, then the next vector field, all the way up to the last one. And if I make these all these tau's to be now uniform ex, standard exponentials, mean one, and I put the h in there explicitly, I can now differentiate with respect to my scaling parameter h. And if I do, of course, I have this whole product of semigroups. I differentiate with respect to the kth one, and I get down the vector field there, right? So this is just the product rule on this composition of semigroups. All right. Now I use commutators to commute this V to the front for every single one of them. So now I end up with this V at the front with this random time here, time here. And then I end up with this whole set of commutators. And now these random times don't add up to one. So I add and subtract one from tau K, which are mean one random variables. And so now I actually get the deterministic semi vector field here and then two error terms. And of course, then I can just apply variation of constants formula to get the, this evaluated at h equals zero and h equals h are the random semigroup I care about and the deterministic semigroup with these two error terms. And then you just prove that these two error terms are order h squared. You integrate over a length of h and you get that this whole semigroup error is order h. Easy peasy. All right, so there you go. Any other questions? So as usual, you could have just, you just do it with your humble. Whenever you want to propagate the error forward. So that, that was news to me, but it shouldn't have been probably. All right, so kind of let me show you some pictures now. All right, so here I'm just going to show you this one again. We're going to run it for longer times. So it's going to run much faster and it's going to come to equilibrium. Actually, let me come here. So here we go again. Actually, I'm gonna, since I'm short on time, I like this one. So, so, so what's happening now is I'm putting Laplacian at the large scale. So there's no dissipation in the intermediate scales. And there's only, I mean, at the fine scales, I'm putting Laplacian. This is Fourier space. So this is large Fourier numbers. And forcing here. And you kind of see the equipartitions just like it did for the Euler. But, and then in log, it kind of has some decay. And so you, and you see the structure. So I have this, this body forcing here kind of gives rise to, you see this kind of characteristic shell. This is from this deterministic forcing at the large scale. So you get a really nice deterministic structure at the large scale. All right. And now 
here's the same one again for that one for a slightly different now. So now I have two of them. So now I'm forcing mesoscopically and I'm dissipating at large scale and small scale. And here I'm doing that same thing. And now I kind of get, this is log. So I'm getting a nice equipartition in the middle zone and then some drop off. And now here I'm gonna kind of go to, uh, oh, here it's the same one with starting from a different initial condition. Let's see, it'll kind of come to the same kind of limit in just a second. By the way, th these are great. I've, I've really taken a writing code in Julia. As I said, uh, Shankar, I mean, Nikhil wrote this, but uh, Julia is a great place to write these kind of simulations. It's really nice. All right. Oh, one sec. There was something else that I want to show you. Oh, no, it's gone. Okay. All right. I guess I left it off. Uh, huh. Where's the different viscosities? Okay. I don't know what happened. I lost the slide. I had two different viscosities. Thank you for your attention. And uh, I'm happy to hang around for a while and answer some questions.